I've started building a RISC-V CPU and the module on the left here is an add and subtract module, the first module that I've built. And on the right here, I've got the Arduino test module. And that's simply running a test program to see if our add sub module here works. It's generally working. And the next step is to give it a source of numbers to add and a destination for those numbers. Having a look at the RISC-V instruction set manual, if we have a look at the arithmetic operations, specifically the integer register to register operations, we can see that these, uh, these R type or arithmetic operations, they all read the RS1 and RS2 registers as the source and the result is written back into the RD register. So we have a number of registers which are just small fast pieces of storage in the core of the CPU and these registers can be used for general arithmetic operations. RISC-V specifies 32 general purpose registers. And in the instruction set manual, they include this list here, which gives some conventions as to what these registers should be used for, although they can generally be used for whatever you like. In terms of adding and subtracting, we can use any of them, except for X0, uh, they're all read-write. X0 is actually a fixed hardwired to zero value. so we can't change that and uh, we can only read it and it will always give us zero. But all of the others we can use as both the source and destination registers for our add sub module. So the question is, how can we build a circuit, a digital circuit that is able to remember a 32-bit number? We can store information in a digital circuit by adding some feedback. For a simple example, we'll have a look at this OR gate circuit here. We can see that the output is fed back to the input. And because an OR gate will produce a high output with a single high input, you can imagine that if this output ever becomes high, then it will be locked in high. And so we can store a one in this loop. Uh, to see that, we can change our low input here to a high. And this, of course, means that we have one OR something. So the output becomes high, and therefore this input has now become high. So when we change this back to low, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything because our output and therefore one of the inputs was already high. And so we say that we have latched the value 1 into this circuit. Of course, that's not very useful. It will remain 1, and we can't set it back to 0 until we remove power from the circuit. So now let's look at a slightly more complex circuit. This circuit is called an SR latch. You can see that we have a set input and a reset input. The primary output is our Q here, and the idea is that when we set here, uh, which is done with a zero, note that there's a bar over the top here, meaning that a zero activates this input. If we put this to zero, then our output should change to one. And you can see that because we have a NAND gate here, currently it's one NAND one. One NAND one produces a zero, but as soon as we set this to a zero, our output will change to a one. That one is then fed to the input of the other NAND gate. So this will change the properties here. Currently we have a zero input forcing a one, but as soon as this changes to a one, we'll end up with one NAND one, which produces a zero, changing the input to this gate. So if I set this to zero, you can see that we have latched a one into the output. And if I change it back to one, that one will stay there. And the reason that one stays there is because this has latched in a zero on the not Q output. And generally the way this circuit works is our Q and not Q outputs here will always be the opposite to each other. Same principle applies in the other direction. If we set our, if we change our reset to a zero, then the zero here will give us a one at the output. One and one will give us a zero, and then we'll be latching in a one here and a zero here. So we've set that to zero, and because we have a zero now coming through to the input here, it doesn't matter what we do here. And so setting our input, uh, our reset input back to a one doesn't change the state of the circuit. So we can use this simple, or relatively simple circuit, to latch in a zero or a one. So now we have a way to control that output. We can make this circuit a little more useful by adding an enable signal. We, the enable signal here feeds into these two NAND gates. And so while this enable is low, the set and reset inputs to these NAND gates has no effect. But when we set it to high, 
then the set signal will be allowed to pass through or the reset signal to the SR latch on the right here. So if I want to set, uh, our output is currently low, so if I want to set, I can change the set signal here to a high. And notice that these are no longer inverted because we are using NAND gates, and that's inverting the set signal as it passes through. So I've set, hit the set to high, and our output hasn't changed, but as soon as I activate the enable, this high signal into here will allow this high to become a low here, and remember a low on the input to our SR latch here will set the output. And we can see that that has now flowed through. If I clear my set signal and disable, then our circuit is now in a steady state and we have saved the value one into our latch. If I change, if I want to clear that same process, I can set our reset to high, activate the enable, and then the output goes low in the same way that it did before. The high here is passed through as a low signal. Low on this reset line here activates the low signal through to here. One more useful change to our circuit is to replace our SNR with a single D input. And this D input will determine what goes through to our queue when we enable. If it's a high here, so this high is coming into what was our set signal, that means as soon as we enable, that high will go through to our queue. If we change our D to a low, then as soon as we enable, that low will be passed through to Q because we've inverted the low and we have a high coming in here on our reset line. So as soon as we change this to high, that reset triggered a low signal on the output of our SR latch. And the final and slightly more complex change that I'll make here is to allow us to use a clock rather than an enable signal. The clock signal here behaves in a similar way to the enable but it only activates on the rising edge. It doesn't activate the whole time that it's high. And the way that we do that is we have a D latch here with enable and a D latch here with an enable. And only one of them will be enabled at a time because we have the clock being used as the enable signal for this one uh, on low. So because we're inverting it here, when the clock is low, this first D latch will be enabled. We invert again, and then when the clock is high, then this D latch will be enabled. And so whatever value is on D will first pass through to here while the clock is low. And then when the clock is high, this latch will be disabled, meaning a change in D will no longer pass through. But this latch will be enabled, and so the value here will pass through. And so it's only on that transition from a low to a high clock that the value of D will pass all the way through. So at the moment our output is low, we have a low on D, so let's change D to high and watch it propagate through. So we start out with a low clock, the low clock enables our first latch here, so we can see the input to these NAND gates is enabling them, and therefore the value here is passing through the same way that we saw previously. This latch is disabled, however, and so that value is not being passed through to Q, and Q is still latched at a low value. If we change our clock to high, giving us a rising edge, now this latch is disabled, but this latch is enabled, and our input here has gone through to the output. And this means that even though our clock signal is high, changing D will have no impact on the output, uh, and even changing the clock down low will have no impact. It's not until we go from low to high that we propagate the signal through. So we now have a synchronous mechanism for storing one bit of data. And I should point out there are other simpler ways of implementing this. This is obviously using quite a lot of hardware, uh, but this is an easy one to explain now, and it's an easy one to build reliably as well. And when we use a clock like this rather than an enable, we call this a flip-flop. Now, I don't want to build these manually, and I certainly don't want to be building 32 of these for, my, uh, for each 32-bit register. 
and then I would have to have 32 of those stacked together. So it would be a ridiculous number to try and build by hand. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and use a 74HC574. And this is an octal D-type flip-flop. Octal just means there are eight of them. So we have eight D flip-flops in this one package. So I can put four of these together and that will give me a single 32-bit register. And one other nice feature that this chip has, although unfortunately I won't be able to use it, uh, which I'll explain in a moment, is that it has tri-state outputs. And you can see that here with the buffers along here. So we have our eight flip-flops and the D inputs are coming in through the top. The Q outputs come down through these buffers. Now, if our output enable signal is set to low, then we get our outputs as we expect. But if we set this to high, the outputs are all set to high impedance. That means that we can connect multiple of these chips together, all sharing the same outputs. And we just enable the one that we want to drive the line. Now that would be nice if we were only selecting a single register, but we need to select two registers. So we actually need two sets of these tri-state outputs. So I'll have to use another chip for that and we'll just use this for the D flip-flops. The chip that I'll be using for that is the 245, which I've used in a previous video. And it's an octal bus transceiver with tri-state outputs, meaning we have eight of them and it has tri-state outputs and it's just going to buffer those. So it's going to enable them by outputting to the bus or it's going to set them to high impedance. And we can see that down here. Here's just one bit of our circuit. There are eight of these. Uh, so this chip also has a direction signal and the direction signal here will determine whether we are passing a value into B and out through A or into A and out through B. I'm not going to use that feature. I just happen to have these chips in hand, which is why I'm using them. Uh, so I'll always set the direction uh, just to be high, meaning we are passing through A and out to B. In order to activate this chip though, we have that direction set, but we also have this output enable set to a zero. And when that's set to zero, this is enabled, our output goes through. When our output and enable signal is high, this AND gate is disabled meaning this buffer is disabled and our signal gets blocked. And that essentially makes our output high impedance. So I can use two of these for each flip-flop to control the RS1 and RS2 outputs, which go through to our add subtract module. Now the circuitry for this isn't overly interesting, so I've gone ahead and put it together in KeyCAD. Each of our D flip-flops has eight bits in it, so I need four of those, and we can see those across the top here. Each of these Q outputs is then fed into two sets of our buffers. So the first buffer here gives us an A output and the second set of buffers here give us a B output. Now the A and B, I've named them like that to match our PCI Express card edge pinout, but these will ultimately be fed into the RS1 and RS2. And we also need to be able to input the result from the add sub module. They'll be connected to this C bus here. So that's just our D inputs to our flip-flops. And on the rising edge of the clock, which is connected to all four of these chips here, that signal will be latched into our flip-flops. I've also added some indicator LEDs down the side here. And this will just allow us to see what value is stored in this 32-bit register. This is just one of our registers. We'll ultimately need 32 of these. I think that's going to be a bit of a problem, uh, which I'll come to in the next video. But for now, we'll just build one or two of these and that's enough to make a working CPU. It may be an issue to get it fully compliant for RISC-V, but we'll, we'll deal with that another time. I've also gone ahead and put together the PCB. And you can see that I've got the card edge connector similar to what I built before, and this follows the same profile with our A, B, and C buses, each 32 bits. We have our 74 series chips along here. So again, these are the D flip-flops and the buffers. Some of those are on the other side as well. And we have our LEDs down the bottom here so that we can see what the value is. In the next video, I'll put together another board that these can slot into. This is, of course, just a single 32-bit register, and I'll want multiple of them. So I'll create a board that these can slot into, and that board will be responsible for selecting which registers 
produce the RS1 and RS2 outputs and which register should be written to.